Data storytellers. Today on the show, I have with me Lisa Cohn. Um, I was looking forward to this conversation, and I can't wait to dive in. Lisa, welcome on the show. Thanks for having me. So, Lisa, um, you have a an interesting background. Um, you've been with Microsoft for like seventeen years, and uh, can you just give us a little bit of an introduction about uh, what you do and also what got you into data science in the first place? Yeah, so most recently I've been head of data science for Twitter, leading an organization of data analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. And, you know, really my my passion through this and previous roles has been helping the product and the organization make best use of their data, um, really to have a data-driven strategy and data-driven products, really like that application of ML and AI within the product itself to deliver better customer experiences, um, and also to help the organization best utilize their data science organization. So really like positioning the org in a way that they can have that maximum impact and potential as well. Um, so in within Twitter, um, you know, the team spans across uh, various pillars and priorities of the company and products. So um, health and trust and safety, misinformation, content, um, account integrity being one area, um, growth being another key pillar with the overall funnel optimization onto the platform, um, sign up optimization, activation, engagement, retention. Um, a third pillar being around um, core product experiences with ML applications towards personalization, um, such as home timeline ranking, content recommendations, search algorithms, um, trend and event aggregation, um, a lot of experimentation across all these areas. Um, another pillar area around like future innovation areas where we're trying kind of new um, product experiences and establishing like product market fit metrics. And then a couple cross cutting areas with kind of company wide metrics for the external internal reporting um, and then um, data engineering also being cross cutting so we can share data across. Mm, okay, sounds like a sounds like an exciting mission. And uh, again, you uh, when I reached out to you, um, I was very careful to you know, reach out to individuals who would actually really want to see how their professional journeys evolved. And I see that you've been with uh, Microsoft, started off as a product manager. So, what really led you into the world of data science, and how did you end up being you know the head of data science at you know one of those companies that everyone knows? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, starting back from school, you know, I was always really passionate about math and science and my my bachelor and master were in applied math, applying um, math like towards applied sciences. And when I joined uh, Microsoft, I was working on Visual Studio. Um, one thing that I was really excited about in that role was being able to impact, you know, millions of developers um, by improving the C Sharp and Visual Basic languages and integrated development experience. And just seeing like how day to day, you know, our, our world, our life runs on software, you can't do much without interacting with software in various parts of your day. And so I was really excited about um, the ability to be part of that process. Um, and yeah, it was an, an exciting role. And I felt like it was like also a good place to learn about software development because we were building developer tools um, for developers. And so just to kind of learn best practices within tech and the industry for engineering processes. I, you know, I also enjoyed kind of the ship cycle. I think I was deciding at one point between academia and industry, and I wanted to be in a a place where, you know, I, there was a lot of learning and I found that I could do that in both environments. Um, but I did like that aspect of going from a spec to then seeing something in in customers' hands. And I within that cycle, you know, I was I was really enjoying the feedback cycle. Um, and you know, it started with a lot of qualitative feedback, but then as big data was growing, um, I was increasingly interested in the quantitative as well as the qualitative feedback. And then again, because of like the math background, it kind of felt like coming back to those roots as um really that's when the data science role was forming. Uh, we didn't even have that title at Microsoft before then. We, we called it like experience and insights at first, and we had to kind of develop the discipline and the function, um, and then kind of started establishing more regular data-driven business reviews. Um, and so I had been working in kind of performance analytics and, you know, analyzing compatibility in other areas. But yeah, that was kind of when I transitioned into that role in Visual Studio, working on our telemetry um, as we evolved from kind of a box product to online service, evolving our terms of service agreement so we you know could collect data with users permission um, even just basic things like licensing data um, 
And yeah, and then after the Visual Studio role, um, that's when I was partnering closely with Azure and the cloud was growing. And so I moved into the Azure Data Science Organization. Um, and that's the, the group that I was leading um, right before I left Microsoft. So the charter of that group was around just helping customers be successful on Azure. Um, and so we had, um, similar to Twitter, kind of the, the growth um, analysis in terms of optimizing the funnel, um, as well as helping working with the Azure service teams on improving retention, um, but also a number of machine learning models that we hosted um, um, in production. There were a lot of them internal facing to help the various programs around Azure be successful. So helping the marketing team with propensity models to identify which customers were most likely to convert or be high value. And so they could kind of optimize their engagements, um, working with the support team on natural language processing and then queue optimization within their ticket queues so they could identify which tickets were at risk. Um, and then, you know, optimizing our um, payments, uh, fraud analysis, um, improving our startup developer trial programs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. now, actually, one of the, my questions was going to be like, okay, so you worked at Microsoft on Azure. So it's more like a customer facing role in terms of helping customers to be successful. And how is that different from what you do right now when you're trying to make Twitter more data driven? But I guess you've done some of that already at Microsoft. And then how did you see this whole industry change? As you mentioned in the beginning, you didn't even have that role defined, but then you know, data is the new oil and the hype cycle began. Uh, so how did you see the, the key challenges and opportunities in the industry evolve over the past 10 years? Uh, or 20, rather. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, 20 years ago, I mean, even if you look at the the schooling programs, like we didn't have um, data science specific programs. So I've noticed that, for example, when hiring, like depending on the graduation date of the person that you're interviewing, like they may have learned it, you know, probably had some kind of degree in sciences, but then worked in some kind of related quantitative field um, if they graduate or, um, earlier or if it's been, you know, within the last 10 years, then, you know, you might see like more of a data science specific program that they completed. There's a, a lot of boot camps now, you know, there's just so many online programs, podcasts like this to learn about, um, you know, what it's like to be in this craft. So, yeah, I think the, you know, it, the the function itself has become more established. Um, I do know, I still notice that, um, you know, a difference, for example, from software development, I think, which has been around longer, I think sometimes the career stage profile is a little bit more established, like typically we're like at Microsoft and Twitter, we're still kind of evolving. I think, you know, it's good practice to always be evolving with the latest industry trends, but, you know, the the names for ex the titles at different companies sometimes mean different things. We're still kind of normalizing um, or rationalizing that. Um, but other things I think that have changed over the past 20 years, um, I think like anything kind of the level of um, abstraction, if you will, like continues to increase, like in developer tools, you know, we were trying to include, you know, create libraries to make asynchronous development, for example, easier. So you don't have to work on the same level of detail, you know, no, not many people have to use assembly code today. And I think kind of similarly in data science, um, we have so many great tools today to help with the machine learning model development process. It's like you can really spend a lot of your time on more of the creative sides versus kind of the more repetitive tasks. And so I think that's really exciting um, to see the direction of the field and kind of the power that that continues there as well. Mm, absolutely. And if you look at uh, like... The organization's adoption, and I'm sure that you talk with your peers um, about this all the time as well. So since data science emerged as this you know, huge opportunity of, wow, we can actually improve our business performance by looking at our data, getting it in shape, churning some information out of it, and then turning them into insights, actually impacting the business in a meaningful way. So with the initial excitement about this, um, how did you see the the issue of adoption? Did you see this as a problem when you were working with customers, maybe over at Microsoft as well? Like the technology is there, but then how about the adoption on the on the user's end, whether it's internal or external? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, for any change, it's like you're changing some habits. Like we you used to know how you know used to ship the products without all of these tools in the past and so you're kind of trying to yeah it, it change a, a habit which requires like investment over time and I think the 
the best strategy I found there is to really, um, you know, position the, the data science team and the, the role of data science as being a core um, partner, a strategic, um, strategic thought partner with the other functions such as engineering, product design, research, or, you know, marketing, finance, other roles that I've worked with as well. And to identify like um, shared goals, these are generally the, the key results across the organization and, um, and positioning the data science role so that you're kind of early in the planning process as well, helping, um, you know, set the strategy and direction. So you don't want it to be kind of an afterthought. If you've already decided the direction and then you're just kind of pulling the data, it's not truly data driven and you're not taking advantage of all of the insights that you could um, to really have the most impact. And so I find, you know, when we can really start to ask the questions early, be very curious about the data, um, that's when we really have the um, the biggest kind of metric mover kind of ideas that come up. Mm, yeah, this is so important. Like, as you said, get in early because if you're getting too late, you will be an afterthought. And even if, you know, people maybe engage with, you know, your reports, it's dangerous to become the data vending machine. And that's not how you want to be positioned in the organization. This whole idea of being the trusted business advisor, the business partner, you know, that's the the holy grail. So if we zoom in just a little bit on that, so what, what have you seen as the crucial components of that approach? So it's great that you guys know the technology, it's there's huge potential in it, and it's very complicated. A lot of times you need, you know, a group of PhDs to figure out how this thing will work, which will deliver immense value. But then on the other side, and maybe on the on the softer side of that skill set, uh, what have you found yourself investing in in order to really push the needle and elevate the position of data science in the organization? Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, that idea of kind of being brought in early, I think it's... Um, can be a challenging premise because you know there's only so many people to include you want to kind of move fast and be agile and you know i think there are many aspects of the development process that we're trying to kind of shift left and so you know it becomes a lot of things to do at the the beginning when you're kind of writing that initial spec and trying to have the initial idea but i think the idea is if you can um, position data science so it's really helping you come up with those ideas then then it's not seen as like an extra tax or overhead that i need to include it's like actually that's really what i what i need to come up with the best ideas and so in order to enable that you know you want the data science team to be of course like an expert in your craft but also an expert in the domain and what you're trying to um um to improve or you know what are the objectives or the goals of the product or organization and then um having the data science team like spend some time reflecting on that you know outside of kind of the day-to-day -day tasks you need a bit of time to you know, kind of think about what what are the patterns that I've seen? What are some surprising insights that I've noticed along the way? Um, and so if you can kind of come to those cross-functional discussions with some of those gems, um, like, for example, you know, we have these two customer journey paths, and I find that, you know, customers coming from one entry point have like five times higher lifetime value than the other one. We seem to you're also kind of aware of what's happening within the org. We seem to be struggling to kind of manage resources across all these. What if we just, you know, in fully make the decision to prioritize on this one channel um, and, you know, have a, a great ROI there? You know, why don't we take that strategy for at least this quarter or, or six months? Mm -hmm. And doubling down on the 80-20 and, and then uh, prioritizing. And then this is so true, but because with this, what you're providing is not technology, right? Like, okay, technology is part of your service, but what you're providing is almost like a consulting value in this where people who engage with you now suddenly look at you as not like the the, the, the IT person or you know, data science team doing data science stuff in the data science corner, but these are our partners, you know? I just right. uh, had, a, a, had a podcast with Brian Bolzer from Pepsi and he said that we, we can really create this camaraderie with the with the business users by but by getting into that world and really getting invested in in that. So I have a few questions around that, but you mentioned that okay, you need to sit down with the data science team and have these intentional discussions. So that's another challenge that we hear often that you work with incredibly talented, smart people, again, often PhDs. Um, but a lot of times they can have a little bit of a tunnel vision in, in in data science, which is only natural, right? They're experts in their domain. So um, what was your approach to maybe getting them outside of that bubble and expanding their scope 
and their skills? Have you had a specific strategy? What was your approach to this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I generally think of kind of these three spheres regarding the skill set of a data scientist um, within industry. Um, one is, of course, the technical skills, which you're alluding to with the PhD, whether it's the, you know, the economics, the machine learning, the querying, um, the, you know, statistics, experimentation, etc. Um, but another one being the ability to take that um, that data science technical expertise and apply it to a domain. And, you know, sometimes people might be hiring for a specific domain, having experience in that domain. I, I find like generally, if you've been able to apply it to various domains in the past, like you can generally learn it, but it takes intention to learn it. Like you have to be a virtual member of that cross-functional engineering product design research team. Like you're kind of in the rhythms with them. So you're getting some of that through osmosis and, you know, you, um, you feel like a, a part of the team and you're you're getting that context. Um, maybe it's um, around having domain context in the product. So spending time with the product itself, either, you know, like the Visual Studio example, dog fooding, creating apps, um, so that when you're looking at this data, you know what it represents and what that user experience was. And it might even spark ideas of more data that you want to acquire to connect to the data that you've been working with. Um, there's, you know, trainings that you could take about um, the area that you're working on or it's such a, so getting involved in the domain, I think is actually a key part of the um, data scientist job. And so by putting that within the kind of career stage profile, and then, you know, something that you're evaluating, because again, it's that application of the data science to the domain, that's kind of where you have the impact with those data science techniques, um, then that's um, a way to kind of make it core to the the data science roles and you know we have different like training and learning opportunities whether it's kind of mentorship on the job or kind of more official trainings um and then finally the last the third sphere i would mention is around the communication cross-group collaboration influence prioritization etc mm. so it's interesting to me that um i would imagine that in a company like microsoft especially with data centric solutions also that they position towards their customers you would assume that the entire business would already be data driven. And with that, there's a certain level of uh, data literacy fluency. You and I just touched on that even before we started recording the podcast. So in this, when you say, okay, maybe I want to want my data scientist to spend time with the product, to get immersed in that domain, to acquire that knowledge and understanding and learn to speak the language, right? To close that gap between business and data. So that's what you do to proactively get closer to, to your target audience. At the same time, there are different approaches to bringing your audience closer to you. So this whole idea of data literacy by instilling that knowledge, getting them to be data fluent and more familiar to break down that barrier. So have you guys had a targeted a uh, project around this or an initiative where you try to elevate the organization's understanding and literacy and fluency in data-driven initiatives? Um, and yeah, that's absolutely right. As you mentioned, it's, um, you know, while data is, of course, part of the data science profession, you know, if you look at a product manager, um, core um, competencies and that function, like they're also going to have aspects around being data-driven. And so it's, I guess, helpful that kind of, you know, it's part of multiple um, folks um, focus to ensure that they're using data. And yeah, I would say across the organization, you know, you might have varying levels based on kind of the background of those folks, or um, I find like, for example, growth teams tend to be very data driven because they're like living and breathing the numbers. And so they get to, to know that really well. Um, but of course, other other groups as well. Um, I think what are some things that have worked well? Of course, we've done kind of the data democratization. So you don't want the data science team to be the bottleneck for a team being able to just have the regular running of the business, um, like understand general trends. And so there are some, um, you know, self-serve solutions, whether it be kind of dashboards or kind of more event driven data, like um, Interon or Amplitude that you're kind of exposing to others to use, depending on the level of um, um kind of fluency or experience in kind of SQL and querying tools. Um, so I think that that helps as far as um, kind of unblocking the running the day-to-day -day of the business. Um, and then, you know, and then you can kind of engage more partnering on the, the strategic questions together. And maybe kind of building off of the last question that you had as well, I think another important thing in terms of building that bridge is having a common language. Um, and so, 
at one point, I remember I was working in a team where we had a reputation, maybe per your PhD reference of like being more academic, like we were publishing white papers and, you know, we really needed to put it in the context and the language of the audience that we were talking to because they didn't have white papers and as one of the docs in their product development process, they had specs and, you know, so like we needed to kind of integrate better in that way and kind of use more language of the stakeholders. We, you know, also had all these, um, I don't know, more complicated kind of flow chart diagrams and like, you know, precision recall graphs. And like, you needed to kind of, we were at one point, we just said, okay, let's just do like single axis charts and just have like a clear recommendation. Here's the supporting points. And that was another way to kind of think, help the um, story land with different exec audiences. Um, and then maybe lastly on this topic, I would say like having a good community of champs across the different teams has also been really effective. And so we've done trainings and things like that, but I find it's really like when you can partner together on a project, then you're really like teaching someone to fish because you've kind of worked deeply on a project together. They know the metrics, they know the techniques, they know how to run it. And so we did that, like, for example, in, um, in Azure, as we were running a number of experiments on our free trial, like we worked with the marketing team that had a great um, analyst team as well. And so we did some projects together where we were running experiments together, and then they would run the next few of them and we would kind of review as needed. But, and so that was a really scalable approach, I think that worked well. Um, and mm. then we would do office hours as a way to kind of answer questions in a scalable way. Mm. So you mentioned the the story to make sure that the story lends better. And I think th this might be a good opportunity for us to spend a little bit of time on that topic specifically, because uh, you mentioned storytelling in connection to your empathy with the audience, your understanding of the audience speaking their language. So that story needs to be told in a way that resonates with the audience. And then also at the same time, you mentioned that you want to have the champs in the business. And the two almost kind of go hand in hand. Again, just Brian from Pepsi mentioned that the best way to tell the story is to, is to get someone to tell the story for you, right? So, so what was your approach to how important was storytelling for you as a data science professional? And maybe how did your interest and investment in this area evolve over time as your responsibilities, I imagine, also became, you know, wider and maybe even more challenging. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a key aspect. Absolutely. There's actually a book called um, Scientists Must Speak. I think we had a course by that name as well. It's kind of catchy, but it, it it it's a strong point because, you know, if you have all this innovation, um, but nobody knows about it because we can't communicate it or get it to be like understood or, or heard by the, another group, then you're really limited in kind of the impact that you can have with it. And a lot of times in data science where we need those strong partners um, within other teams to help us act. And that's really where we have the, the impact. And so um, I think that the storytelling is a very important part and a key aspect is, you know, getting to know your audience. So, you know, within the team, we'll often have you know, like a data science show and share session. That's another way that we kind of spread information across the team and learn about what's happening and get new ideas. Um, there, you might have more of a technical detail that's very appropriate for your audience because you're actually trying to share best practices of different approaches and techniques. Um, however, you might be talking about the same project, but like with your cross-functional stakeholder. And it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's not their responsibility to go into all this detail. Like that's kind of your job. Your responsibility is to bubble it up to, the key takeaways and recommendations. And then I guess along those lines, as you kind of talked about, um, like through my career working in different forums, you know, when you're working in a more executive audience, you want to make that point as succinctly, but also convincing. So, you know, as much as you can just boil down the whole project to like the key takeaway with like the salient supporting data point, and then you let them drive the conversation and based on where they want to go. And of course, you can answer questions, but I find that's kind of the most efficient way and the most effective way to land um, the point within those forums as well. Hmm. And this then might be a good opportunity for us to touch on this seeming contradiction between uh, how data science is called the sexiest professional of the 21st century. Right. And it, it's growing literally by, you know, millions of people every single year. At the same time, there is this lurking, I would say, anxiety, concern that a lot of this domain will be automated out of existence or if not out of existence, out of relevance, you know, uh, or wait. So what is your take on this? And I will have some follow up questions that, that ties back to the storytelling element. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked a couple of points through the conversation around really the application of data science to these domains. And often 
the problem doesn't come to us as a data science problem. Like we talked about that consultative example of finding the right um, entry pass. There's other examples too, where you know something appears like a BI problem, but because we're aware that, okay, we can actually use a, um, a ranking model, so like to bet a, a, a machine learning solution to actually improve this product experience itself. Like that's another way that data science kind of gets involved. And so again, these start as kind of vague, ambiguous goals. Like I want to increase satisfaction or, um, our retention has been dropping, what can we do? And, and so I think a lot of the creativity is going from, you know, that exploratory analysis, the insights into like, and then to how can we turn this into a, a data science or machine learning problem? Like you have this broad tool set and you have to kind of know which one to use in a different, in different settings. Um, and so I think what I see about kind of the latest innovation with the tools is that it's just going to help, um, kind of, again, increase like the the amount of time that data scientists can spend on those creative aspects and then make, um, you know, more efficient the the steps that might be, um, you know, take, consuming a lot of the time in their, in their day. Like you hear about a lot of, you know, 80% of a data scientist's time is spent cleaning the data. Like there's a lot of tasks that you have to do kind of <laughs> behind all the rest of the, um, your work. And so I think being able to make those more efficient, I think will actually make a data scientist job like more fun and uh, rewarding as well. Hmm, absolutely. And even if I think about, um, for example, now I'm hiring a new person, business operations leader. And actually what I want from it, I have very specific tasks that I would want them to do, but also the, the the main value that they can provide if they actually seek out and proactively step into my world and pinpoint opportunities and start working on and fixing them. So let's say from my perspective, and maybe we can talk about that too, let's say Chad GPT, right? Or just in general, like generative language modeling, the technology itself. It's immensely useful. So a lot of the administrative tasks that I have, and it's already alleviating that pressure, but what Chad GPT will never be able to do is come to me and actually get into my world on a human level and then understand holistically what I'm doing and then consult me actively. It can be my vending machine, which is fantastic, you know, but at the same time, that kind of human element, uh, will still be missing. So uh, how do you see, what would you recommend data scientists to invest in if they want to like future proof, uh, proof their careers, not because necessarily uh, they will be automated out of existence, but there will be a lot of people who do invest in those skills that will become only more important as some of these things, like for example, data cleaning will become automated, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... To the extent possible, like, you know, it's always part of our, our job within tech to continue learning the latest technologies. And, you know, it's, it's part of the continuous learning within the profession. And so I think it's good to, you know, be staying up to date and trying out new things. And it's a very exciting one. So I think it's a fun one to be able to try out as well. So I think as much, to, you know, to the extent it can help make data scientists more um, productive, I say like, absolutely, they should, you know, continue to, to learn whether it's, um, you know, the large language models that you mentioned, or just using other machine learning kind of observability tools, um, experimentation tools, like there's just um, so much, you know, great improvements in the tooling. So continuing to leverage those so that you can be more efficient, but then, you know, again, continuing to take more of that strategic role, as you were describing within the organization that um, you know, can't really be automated in that way. Like maybe it's a specific example, um, you know, and I was talking a bit before about like the work we had done on um, support at, at Microsoft, like that actually came to us as more of a BI question. It was like, hey, we want to increase our satisfaction overall for these tickets. Can you please do these cuts on the data? Tell us where we have low set. Is it with vendors? Is it with, is it with full-time support professionals? Is it on a certain topic area? Like help us get to the root cause. And then you know, it evolved into this project, um, you know, led by someone in my, my team around like, well, actually we can develop, use a machine learning model, which would be much more efficient. We can um, have a propensity model to see which of these are likely to have low satisfaction. Then we can actually do observability and kind of do feature importance on this model and see what are the key drivers. But, you know, that wouldn't really be something you would ask I don't know, maybe in the future, I, I don't know, that level, like to transform that into the data problem. I don't know if that's something that chat GPT would necessarily answer. You kind of needed to, you know, um, have a, all of the, the business context. And, you know, I know that's a big part of those models as well as like feeding in more context and giving more like, 
enterprise search data. But again, it's kind of that reframing the problem from business problem into a data science problem where, again, I think the chat GPT translation would probably be more of that BI exercise, whereas like, you know, innovating and coming up with an idea that like, oh, there's actually a, a more powerful, like effective way that we can achieve the overall goal using what I have in my data science tool belt. Hmm, absolutely. And I think this is how typically like a, a seeming risk can be turned into an opportunity when you actually invest in a different vertical of skills and then use what can actually maybe like take over some aspects of your job and use that as a tool. And this also uh, kind of leads us into a question around data center culture. So again, what ChatGPT would never be able to do is address something like organizational change, right? Like culture, it's a set of beliefs and behaviors in the organization. ChatGPT can absolutely help you if you are working on this project, but you will need to be the one who leads it, who drives it. So uh, yeah. data center culture, it's a term that's being thrown around all the time. You hear it at every conference, you know, the, the big consultancies release their annual 80 page ebook on why culture eats strategy. But, but I feel like there's not enough uh, uh, detail and nuance around this conversation. So what does that mean to you? What, what does data center culture mean to you as a seasoned professional? Yeah. Um, to me, a data centric culture is a environment where we're making decisions based on data and we're really learning and curious about the data. So it's not like we're making a decision and then we're giving the supporting data point. Like we're really looking to the data to help, um, you know, identify our, our direction, our path, our, our strategy. Um, and, and I think more and more it's becoming like a a customer expectation as we interact with products, um, of course, in like a privacy and secure way with our data, but it's becoming an expectation that they're, they're going to be data driven, that they're going to be powered by machine learning in some way, because it's, you know, it's more efficient, it's more powerful, you kind of have a certain level of personalization that's expected. And I think, um, you know, with the rise of these large language models as well, like that expectation around the AI around the experience is going to be growing as well, which I, I think is a good thing for data-driven cultures because it's becoming more more and more part of the vernacular. It's more top of mind. And so it's, you know, harder to forget about. It's kind of more top of mind in, in the culture as well. Mm, absolutely. And you seem excited about that. And uh, what else are you excited about in the space? So now if you look at the landscape, you know, you look at, you know, your career, your mission, and then what's to come in this, you know, decade of data, and then what what really gets you going and makes you say that, wow, this is like super exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love working on, um, you know, products that where I really identify with the mission and the the cause and then the ability to really leverage data to um, help them be successful. And so whether that's through the consultative that we mentioned or really having um, data and like ML applications we were discussing in some of the, the Twitter features kind of live as part of the product experience, I think is really exciting as well. And so, yeah, I think this this large language model space is is definitely one of the top things that I've been excited about recently. I think it's just, you know, something we've kind of envisioned in the future. And, you know, for example, I worked on IntelliSense code completion when I first started working on Visual Studio and now having kind of the co-pilot um, experience is it's just like the holy grail of kind of like what we had envisioned like might <laughs> come someday and you know these technologies have been it's it's not like they were just created like they have been around for some time we had used GPT-2 with the Azure Marketplace as a way to kind of query the the catalog um, but you know just the performance of these models has become so um, impressive that that it makes it a much more compelling um you know, value proposition. So mm -hmm. there's there's obviously a lot of um, you know societal like decisions, changes, policies, and things to work through. Um, but I think with kind of any transformation um, that will be part of the process. I think that's also something I've been exciting about. Is kind of excited about is you know places where there are those category changers or really you know huge business transformations, which I think you know happen with a combination of the. Um, like new way of looking at how we might approach a, a scenario, um, application of the data there, and then kind of the, the regulation and policy as well. Hmm, absolutely. And um, I mean, from your perspective, uh, as a senior data science leader, did this whole explosion of chat GPT surprise you? Or were you guys kind of anticipating it? It was a bit of a hockey stick, I would say. It's <laughs> like it had been there, but it's just like... The explosion is pretty high. I think even in the last year, as there's kind of 
been a bit more focused. I think it's been more in the vernacular of like people talking about how to integrate this into their products. Um, but it felt a bit like, you know, AIFI or like sprinkling this technology across. I think now we've kind of worked through and been able to found more and more like really compelling use cases and customer needs um, that this can help address. And so I think that's really one thing in addition to the tech that's really helped um, accelerate it. Hmm, interesting, because um, I mean, I'm in this space, but I'm kind of a laggard in, in adoption of these things. So I, I think I, I adopt one thing every five to 10 years. So after the iPhone, the next thing was probably Apple Pay. I mean, I don't even use, you know, Siri. I'm like a very very old school in these things. But with Chad GPT, just like how practical it is, it was absolutely shocking to me. So, I mean, no one knows what the actual impact will be. It's an ongoing uh, conversation. Um, but just from my perspective, it has that kind of uh, uh, potential that you know, anyone's kind of waiting for the recession to materialize or whatever. But if anything, this is the the kind of weight class that could even impact that. Maybe it, it, it could have this like huge economic impact that no one really anticipated, especially now how, because of the hype and because of the nature of the technology, which is working on data points, right? It's kind of like, okay, no one knows, no one knows what's going to happen. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's so many, you know, variables and interrelated factors. Like if you kind of try to predict, um, you know, what will happen, for example, with, advertising with the search experience where you know you traditionally you go to a landing page and you see you see an ad if you're getting more information not on the web page itself like how does that evolve but you know there's just so many changing pieces that it's like it you know you kind of have to skate to where the puck is going and kind of the experience you see today is not necessarily what you know might be there a year from now and so um yeah it's a it's a fascinating space i think to kind of you know reflect on kind of the different directions all this could go yeah, absolutely. And Lisa, look, this has been a f- fantastic conversation. Um, it was everything I expected it to be. So thank you for your insights. And uh, we also look forward to following you on your professional journey, you know, w- wherever that leads you. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much for the chat today. Great talking with you. It's our pleasure. 